in her prime, the best-selling author in the world. Someone you may have read as a child, but also who wrote a dozen novels for adults and wrote some rather controversial essays that challenged us as Americans. Did tour America, I believe in the 1950s, spoke at maybe Augustana College, who was as close as she came. Um, but one of my favorite authors, and soon to be yours if you're not familiar with her, let's welcome Astrid Lindgren. What a delight to be here. My audience is not generally of this age. <laughs> so I will close my eyes and pretend that you're all quite youthful. And you look pretty good for youth. <laughs> As Mr. Alice has told you, my name is Astrid Lindgren. Oh, but I was not born as her, obviously. It was in 1907 on a little farm that was connected to the rectory in a little village in Sweden. My mother gave birth to her second child, Astrid, they called me. I had an older brother and soon to follow two younger sisters. And there I grew up on the farm. My father, doting, loved children, was a daydreamer, but a good farmer. My mother, stern, and she always believed you should work hard. So a doting far father and a stern mother didn't always mix, but my mother always won. <laughs> yes, she did. Every morning, you children will go out and do your chores, pulling beets, feeding the cattle, and then we would clean up and go to school. And you'd better study hard. I hate to tell you, I did study hard, but I fidgeted terribly, terribly. They would, once they took a picture and all the children in the classroom were sitting very still and I was waving my hand in the picture. They said, I didn't get in a lot of trouble, I just couldn't sit. But when we got home from school and we got our work done, for my mother said, you must work and you must love to work in order to be happy and happy we wanted to be, we would play. My brother and I were expert tree climbers. Even at the age of 40, I could climb trees better than my own children themselves. <laughs> and it was much to their surprise when I'd come up to a pine tree and simply shinny on up. We loved to wander about the flowers, the streams, the trees, the animals. And this is where I just loved to learn nature. My brother and I, we called ourselves the thing finders. And we would come home with seeds and we would come home with stones and we would come home with eggs and all the treasures that you would have in the great land of Sweden. I also loved to write. And I could write in German, English, and Swedish. All three languages helped me a great deal through my life. I would write little stories and send them off, and I'll be danged if the editor of the local paper didn't pick up on it. Of course, I had classmates and I would, that were his children, I would poke them, did your dad get my story? Did your dad get my story? And he did take notice. I loved humor, I loved to use my imagination, and for my final paper in high school, I wrote a huge, huge paper on the life of nuns in the convents during the Middle Ages. Now this is a very difficult subject to put humor into. <laughs> but I was able to work it in quite well. Upon graduation, the editor of the local paper did take note of me and asked me to come on the paper as a trainee. Now you did not have to go to school in those days to become a someone in the paper writing articles. And my task, of course, were obituaries. <laughs> seldom did I have my name tag on them, and seldom were they humorous, because that was frowned upon somewhat. There were many other articles they learned. They would search the papers when my name became well known to see what other articles I had written, but the editor never put my name tag on them, so they didn't know. When I was 17, 
five of my best friends. And friends we were for life, let me tell you. Five of my best friends and I stood on the village square on a fine day in June with comfortable shoes. By the way, if you have to go through life, you really should wear comfortable shoes. <laughs> we had on comfortable walking skirts and nap packs, and we set up on a journey. 200 miles we were going to hike through Sweden. And people would take pictures of us, of course, mostly from the behind. <laughs> and off we sat, stomping along. And the first day out, I did have to get another pair of shoes. And that's really when I learned that comfortable shoes are more important than looks. We would sometimes get picked up. I can remember one day, it was terribly warm, and we'd walked a long distance. Our arms were hanging limply, and our faces drooping sadly, and our feet were at least one meter behind the rest of our bodies. <laughs> and we could hear, oh, behold, an automobile. And so we stood there, so pathetic, and on our loud enough voices to be heard, but pathetic, we said, could we have a ride? <laughs> and the poor gentleman took sympathy upon six sweaty girls, loaded them in, and off to the village we went. If I remember it well, it was that very night in that village, we were to stay at a manor house. But the village itself was having a festival. Maybe it was a Chautauqua, who knows? And. There was a great bonfire, and all the young people sat around the bonfire. And they did something in their village that we did not do. They had a singing contest. I never was known to be a great singer, unlike people that have gone before me here. It's difficult to follow a song and dance routine. But they enticed us, six girls, join in, join in, join in. Well, you hate to be rude. So at last, we did join in, and of course, we won the contest, for we knew all the most wonderful songs. And we caught the eye of the most handsome gentleman in the whole village, much to the disdain of the ladies. I wrote back to the paper. For every three or four days, I would send a missile off to the paper so they could publish it, because everyone in the village was wondering, what are the six girls doing? I said, it is miserable to be a human, and marriage does not seem to end that at all. <laughs> we traveled south, passed into the hills, passed a great lake over a mysterious mountain that was covered in fog, as if a cat had sat down on its haunches. <laughs> and from there, we went to large cities. Now, I will confess that occasionally, maybe more than occasionally, we were given a ride. Sometimes we jumped on a little train if we had enough funds, and sometimes the horse-drawn wagons would come up with milk, milk jugs and milk, just like this creamery, and we would hop on and they would take us to the next village because our feet were weary. We came to one village and I knew Ellen Key lived just a few kilometers outside the village. Ellen Key at that time was a famous author who I just adored. And I really wanted to see her. So we decided just to hike on out there. We were not welcomed, however. And the, the workers there said, did you have an appointment? What are you doing here? Of course, six beautiful girls in their comfortable shoes and their comfortable walking skirt, and we've come to see Ellen Key. Well, she's not seeing anyone today, and just then the top window flew open and out popped her head, her hair all disheveled, and said, what do you girls want? <laughs> With all this commotion, her great St. Bernard came out and bit us. <laughs> and there was blood, and there was screaming, and of course the help there drug us into the house, which was exactly what we had wanted. <laughs> and after they cleaned, us, cleaned her up some, Miss Key came down. 
The poor thing hadn't even dressed. She was in her petticoats. She looked me square in the eye, and she says, button me up, and turned around. And there I was, buttoning the petticoats of Elaine Key. Can you believe it? We were given a fine tour, and then we were taken out to the fine gardens and saw them. Oh, it was wonderful. And then we were immediately sent on our way with a Band-Aid on someone's leg. <laughs> We wrote home about that experience, I will tell you, and it was published in the paper. Oh, the days of my youth were wonderful. My parents now remember, worked at the rectory and very conservative people. And one day I came home and I had cut all my long, beautiful hair off into a short bob because you know, it was about 1917, 1918, and that was the look of those girls then. My father was taken back. My gentle father could not believe his eldest daughter would do such a thing. And my mother did not speak to me for three days because she said she did not recognize me. <laughs> I left the paper and I went to the big city of Stockholm. Now, I call these my very lean bachelor years. And I call them that for two very good reasons. Number one, we had few funds to keep me in school there. I went to the Bar Lock Institute. And there I learned stenography, I learned accounting, I learned business cor uh, correspondence, and I learned touch typing. Touch typing for students was you couldn't look at the keyboard. They would put this piece of paper over the keyboard and how do you know where the E and the Z are? But you learn. And I became quite proficient at this. But I had left all my friends behind and I had left my wonderful family and wonderful brother behind and I had left all that wonderful food from the farm behind. <laughs> my parents would send a package Oh, as often as they could, perhaps every three weeks, perhaps every month, I would cut the cheese, I would take some of the meat and cut that bread that mother had made, and I would just dream of being home in her kitchen. But I could only eat a little every day because it had to last. And thus it was my lean years. But upon completion of, of this, I tried to sell myself at 19, as a very sophisticated woman in the big city. I applied for a job and received it at the Automotive Club. An automotive club in those times, well, automotives were fairly new, and they would race about the countryside, and we would, or the Automotive Club would arrange races, as well as tours about Sweden, and you can stay at this place, and you can see this, and you should eat at this restaurant, and, and so I helped to organize these. And of course, being 19 and young and gregarious, I was able to go to all these races and get signatures from all these famous drivers. What fun it was. The, the man who owned the company was named Strew Lindgrist. And I fell in love. And in 1931, we were married. I had two children. I had a son named Lars and a daughter named Karen. And during those years, I continued to write. I took care of my children. We would go to the park every day. I would look at the trees, but I dared not climb them in the big city. But I did think about it more than once. I had met many wonderful friends that there, too, I remained friends with them for my lifetime. And I wrote stories. And I would send them to magazines. And my friends and I would sit on the park benches and we would talk about how the world was changing during the 30s and the evil that was coming into the world in those days. In 1939, Hitler rose to power and Stalin and Mussolini and Sweden was to remain neutral. Sweden was to remain neutral. We would hear this over and over, but our fear was still there as our neighbors would be invaded. I applied for a job at what's called the Institute of Criminology 
during those war years. And from 1939 until 1945, I worked there as reading all the letters and I was a censor. I knew more about things that were happening in Europe in those days than most of the Swedes. But I was sworn to secrecy, so I could not share any of it except in my diaries. And even then, I had to be very cautious what I put in. But the sad stories would fill me with just dread. Dread for these individuals in Poland and, and Belgium that would write to their relatives in Sweden. It was a dark, dark time. There were a few highlights. One wasn't such a great highlight, but turned out quite well, was that my daughter developed pneumonia. And so she was bedridden, and she would call to her, Mother, Mother, come and tell me a story. And I would sit down with a book, and no, she would say, tell me a story. So using my imagination, I began to tell stories about a red-headed girl that lived in Sweden. And she recovered well, and I obviously went back to work. But often she would say at night, tell me about that red-headed girl. And we would talk about this young girl. And she would help me make up some of the plots, you know, total nonsense, ridiculous. But it was a light spot in those dark days. And in 1943, she developed the measles. And once again was bedbound and said, tell me all the stories about Pippi Longstocking, mother. <laughs> and I did. And then I fell on the ice that winter and hurt my ankle very badly. And I was told to lay down and rest for two, three weeks maybe. Well, you know my mother, she had said, you must learn to love to work. So I thought, oh, I'll just take this time to eat smoked salmon and rest. <laughs> and that lasted an hour or so. And then I took up my pad and my paper, and because I had learned shorthand quite, quite well, all I needed was a pad and a paper, and I began to write down all these stories that my daughter and I had, had come to love so dearly. On her 10th birthday, I, I, I did get them typed up. I, my ankle did heal, and I could still climb trees. And <laughs> I typed them all up and got them put in a leather-bound book. And for her 10th birthday, she was given the original Pippi Longstocking Aww. stories. Yeah. Now, I had a dear friend who was a librarian, Ella Olison, And she said, I would like to see this book. So I shared it with her, and she was immediately taken with Pippi Longstocking. It was 1945, the war was come to an end, and the dark times were over, and people wanted something light. She said, we'll have it published. But you're going to have to take the thing out of there about the bucket of urine, and you're going to have to take all the stories out of there about the manure. And she was crossing out a lot of the interesting parts, I thought. <laughs> I rewrote it three times, and by September, it was ready to be published. I went to the biggest publisher in Sweden, and they sent me a note quickly. This story is nonsensical. We will not publish it. <laughs> Ella said, oh, what are they thinking? So she said, write a play. Now, she was a librarian, but she was also in children's theater, and she was on the Children's Literacy Board of Sweden. This woman had some clout. She put together this play about Pippi Longstocking, put it on in her theater, put it on in a traveling theater, and all through Sweden, people were beginning to hear about Pippi Longstocking. I went to a second publisher, who I thought was reliable, only to find out later that they were this close to bankruptcy, and they said, we'll take your story and the story was published. And Pippi Longstocking became a psychosis in Sweden. That's what they called it, the Pippi Longstocking psychosis. And all the children wanted a Pippi Longstocking book for Christmas. Yes, let us hear more. And I began to talk on the radio and I would tell Pippi Longstocking stories on the radio in my best, best voice without the urine and the manure in them. And, <laughs> It was wonderful. 
we went to press and the books sailed off the shelves. <laughs> Before Christmas, every child wanted a Pippi Longstocking book for Christmas. And the presses went to work and they were still running the presses on Christmas Eve, loading the boxes and taking those books to the stores so that every child could have a Pippi Longstocking book for their Christmas gift. Between 1945 and 1950, over 300,000 Pippi Longstocking books were sold. Well now, you know I told you that I couldn't just lay there, but I did learn I love to write laying down. <laughs> So I would take my steno pad and in the mornings I would just write. And so soon I came up with two more Pippi Longstocking books called Pippi Longstocking on Board and Pippi Longstocking on the South Seas because you know of course that's where her father was but maybe you don't but I will fill you in on all that in a little bit. It was wonderful years. And that publishing company did not go bankrupt. <laughs> for I was the top sales one. Now I did get plenty of criticism from children's literature critics <laughs> who said the story has no value and it's nonsensical and the children learn nothing but bad behavior. <laughs> it did not make me sad. <laughs> I enjoyed it immensely. It was to be followed by other books. Some were shorter books and others were uh, uh, longer books. I came up with a, a character named Emil and Emil was, could have been Pippi's brother perhaps. He was so ornery and he always got into so much trouble. It was a joy to sit and write. <laughs> I was able to travel and soon the books were in many many languages all the way to they said, well, let's go down to South Africa. Let's go to South America, Germany. Germans loved Pippi Longstocking. And the poor people didn't have any paper to even print on in those days, and uh, let alone having a publisher. So we would have to print it in German. I would go to Germany, and because I could speak German quite fluently, I would go on radio shows and read Pippi Longstocking to the children there. It was a joy. It was a year of great, it was years of great joy. And then came sorrow. For in 1952, my husband became violently ill and passed away. And it was a year of great grief for me. And I found I couldn't even write. And, and a, it was like a shadow had, had come over me. But my friends, all my friends that I went to school with, all my friends that I had worked with, they all lifted me up and boistered me up, and the editor at the publishing company thought perhaps I could come to work. I said, oh, I will only work half days because I have to lay in bed in the mornings. <laughs> <laughs> and write. So at noon each day I would go to the publisher and there would be stacks of mail. They gave me a personal secretary. <clears throat> there would be phone calls, there would be interviews, there would be trips was good years. It was very good years, those 50s and 60s. <clears throat> but in 1976, the Swedish government, government, which had been socialist party since the 1930s, did me a bad turn, they did, and I'd always supported them. They were charging me 102% tax. <clears throat> that is a lot. <laughs> And because I had a name known on radio, a name known in the papers, I just simply would write stories about these finance officers in the government that didn't understand arithmetic. <laughs> <clears throat> and they would write back in the newspapers about a woman that wrote fairy tales that didn't understand arithmetic either. <clears throat> well, I pushed the agenda quite hard. It was my first time in a political arena and I did receive some criticism. But the fall of that year in September, the Socialist Party was lost the election. 
And it was all because of Pippi Longstocking's mother. <laughs> so I began to think of other causes. And you know, children's rights were one, for I had seen so many children treated harshly. And so I began to advocate for children's rights. I began to advocate against nuclear energy, for I had a great fear of that. Animal rights, for you should see how they raise some animals. <clears throat> well, I'm an old woman by now, right? In my 70s, and people said, how long are you going to continue this? <laughs> and I said, well, as long as I can hear, and I can walk, and I can talk, you will hear from me. And by now, I had five grandchildren. <laughs> and so I bought a house on a flat rock out in the Fords. And we would have, all summer, I would have my brood there, my brother's grandchildren, and we would march about. People thought we were all crazy. <laughs> they would come to the house, and I would take a very long spoon, and I would say, we're going to play the Witch of the Flat Rock. <laughs> And I would take this long spoon and I would put chocolate shavings on it and stick it out the crack of the door. <laughs> and these children would try to get it. And any child that got it, I would reach out and grab them. <laughs> and I would throw them in the log box, I would. And then I would threaten to cut off their fine locks. Oh. But it seemed that the witch of the flat rock could not find the shears. And I would look and look, and while my back was there, you could hear a giggling and a pitter-patter of feet as these children escaped the witch. <laughs> my daughter said, Mother, do you always have to instill fear in the game? <clears throat> I thought it very appropriate myself. I lived a good long life. I received lots and lots of correspondence. They said by the time I passed away, they had put up in the attic. Lord, thank you for not letting the attic fall down. <laughs> 750,000 notes, letters, and correspondence. <clears throat> I always would find a cause. I brought two girls from the, Turkey. There was a Kurdish tribe there, and they had read Pepe Longstocking in Arabic. <laughs> And they'd written me and wanted an education. I said, you sure you come to Sweden, though. No. I'm not going down there. <clears throat> and one of them became a doctor and came to see me often in her adult life. I had a good life. And it's all because of Pippi Longstocking. <clears throat> and so I'd like to share one Pippi Longstocking story with you, just in case you're not real familiar anymore. In a, little in a little town in Sweden, just outside, there's a very unruly yard. And in that unruly yard, there is an old house that is not in the best repair. And that is where nine-year-old Pippi Longstocking lives, all by herself, which is quite good because no one has to tell her when to go to bed. And no one has to give her cod liver oil when she'd rather eat sweets. Now, right next door, there lived a family in a very neat house with a very fine fence around it, a mom and a pop, a regular, and two children. One was Tommy, who never bit his fingernails and would always be very, very obedient. And Annika, <clears throat> who never talked back even when her mother told her to do things she didn't want to and always wore pressed cotton dresses, and she didn't get them dirty. <clears throat> These children often played in the backyard and they would lean on the gate and wonder, I wish someone would move into that house so we could play. <clears throat> and one day, that very thing happened. For you see, Pippi Longstocking, <clears throat> she had a mom a long time ago, but she couldn't remember her, for she had died. And Pippi imagined she was in heaven looking through a peephole, so Pippi would wave every once in a while and say, Don't worry, I'm fine! <clears throat> She also had a father whom she liked very, very much. But he was a captain of a ship, and, during, and they sailed all over the world. But on one day, a great storm came up, perhaps named Ida, and blew him off the ship. And Pippi knew 
that he did not die, for he swam ashore and became the king on a South Sea island. <clears throat> and as soon as he could build a boat, he would sail to Sweden and get her, and she would go back to the South Seas and become a princess. But he had foresight to buy this house with furniture and everything so that when he got too old to be a sailor, he could live there with Pippi. So this is how she came to be there. <clears throat> she left the ship, and she had two items. One was a squirrel, not a squirrel. One was a squirrel monkey that always <laughs> sat on her shoulder, named Mr. Nielsen. And the other was a traveling bag full of gold coins, which I'm sure her father wanted her to have. <clears throat> so she would left the ship with that, and you would think a bag of gold coins would be very heavy, but Pippi Longstocking happened to be the strongest girl in the entire world. <laughs> so she simply picked it up and walked off. But on her way to live in this house, she decided she should have a horse. So she bought the horse, and she put him under the other arm and carried the bag and the monkey sitting on her shoulder and went and lived at the Villa Villa Kula. <clears throat> now Tommy and Annika saw this strange girl coming out of the house. And I only say she was strange, for you see, she had carrot red hair, and she had a little nose about the size of a potato right in the middle of her face, which of course is where every nose should be. <laughs> and it was covered with freckles, her face, and she had a smile that went nearly from ear to ear, and whenever she smiled, her perfect teeth would show. She had a blue dress on that she had obviously tried to make, but ran out of fabric, and so she put Yellow, um, red patches all over it, and she had one very long black stocking and one very long brown stocking, and shoes that were twice the size of her feet, for her father had bought them for her in South America in hopes that she would grow into them eventually, and she loved them, and besides, if your shoes are way too big, you'll never get corns. <laughs> this was what came out of the house and began to walk down the street. Only Pippi Longstocking walked one foot on the, gut, uh, on the curb, thank you, and one foot in the gutter until she disappeared. And then she come walking back, backwards. And Tommy said, why are you walking backwards? And she says, well, everyone in Egypt walks backwards. And Tommy said, you have never been to Egypt. How do you know that? I have never been to Egypt, said Pippi. Why, of course I have been to Egypt. Everyone knows everybody walks backwards in Egypt. I have been all over the world with my father, the captain of the ship. Tommy says, I think you're lying. And poor Pippi hung her head sadly. She says, well, do you know not only everybody walks backwards in Egypt, but in the furthest of India, everyone walks on their hands. He says, now I know you're lying. And she hung her head and she said, yes, sadly I am lying, for I've been to the Congo and people lie there all the time. From seven o'clock in the morning until dark, they lie all the time. <clears throat> Please forgive me. But I've spent so much time in the Congo that I sometimes lie. <laughs> but will you still be my friend? Tommy said, yes. We'll forgive you, but at that moment, he knew this was not going to be a boring day. <laughs> <laughs> Pippi Longstocking invited them into their house, and there they saw a horse on the veranda eating oats out of a soup, soup, turban, soup tureen. And they said, you have a horse? She says, yes, but every afternoon I pick him up and put him in the garden. They said, put him in the garden? Yes, and she picked him up and put him in the garden. Tommy was impressed. They went in and Pippi took three eggs, threw them in the air, and two of them hit the skillet, and the, and the other one landed right on her head. And she said, oh, egg yolks are very good for your hair. <laughs> in Brazil, everyone puts their eggs in their hair, <clears throat> and except one man who ate all of his eggs, and he went bald. <clears throat> but. He was never allowed out of the house because there was such a hoopla when he, a bald man would come out of the house <clears throat> that they had to call the police. And with that, she scraped all the eggshells out of the pan, 
mixed up the flour batter and threw it into the skillet that was warmed up, flipped that pancake up, then browned it on the second side, flipped it over, and landed on their plate. And she said, now eat that while it's still warm. <clears throat> Tommy and Annika ate the pancake. And once they had finished, she took him in the sitting room. But the sitting room only had one chair because Mr. Nielsen only sat on her shoulder and the horse didn't really like the sitting room very much. <clears throat> she had a huge trunk with trinkets of all kinds, eggs and stones and necklaces and mirrors and eyeglass pieces and why it was a mystery to Tommy and Annika. And after she'd shown them everything, she turned to them and she said, you better go home now. <clears throat> because if you don't go home now, you won't be able to come back tomorrow and see me again. <laughs> <clears throat> and so they left. The monkey waving goodbye and Pippi Longstocking lit waving goodbye. And Tommy and Annika knew their life would be changed forever. <laughs> <coughs> and that is the first story in Pippi Longstocking. <clears throat> and now, the adventures of Pippi Longstocking go all over. She fights robbers, she goes to a circus, she fights fires. She even threw two policemen on top of the roof who tried to take her to an orphanage. <clears throat> Pick up a book and read it. They say that <clears throat> Brothers Grimm sold the most children's books, Hans Christian Andersen sold the next most books, and Astrid Lindgren is the third top children's book wow. <clears throat> publisher. <laughs> and thus, I have been named Pippi Longstocking's mother. <laughs> <clears throat> Thank you for your patience. Thank you for your good attentions. And may you enjoy reading forever. How did, how did Astrid know about what life was like in a convent? Or did she make it all up? <clears throat> that is a good question. Of course, she had to do a lot of research. And she didn't have an internet. So she went to the encyclopedia. I made that up. <laughs> but she, she did say, she did say that, that the nuns, or I, I should stay in character, she, I wrote in there that the nuns were wonderful at their handwork. And if they had only had the opportunity to marry, they would have some of the most beautiful underwear in the world. <laughs> <clears throat> Any other questions about dear Astrid? 